When people go missing today, for example, if someone has been reported missing today or even up to the last 10 years or so, um, DNA and the DNA projects that are going on out there and the, and the Doe Network and all these other websites and, and DNA um, databases that are, have been created give people hope. It gives people hope that their loved one may be found, the missing person may be found through DNA. But the cold cases, these older cases... Um, it gives, if, if there are still relatives alive who, uh, it, these older cases, if they still have relatives living who remember them and remember when they went missing, uh, I'm sure it gives them even more hope because they have had to live with this for so much longer. I think, and, and I can only speak from what I've read because I've never had this happen to myself. But I can only imagine what these people go through in those first few days. They must have so much hope that it's just a misunderstanding, that there's just been a miscommunication, that the person maybe just has some problem with their phone or, or able to communicate. And then as time goes on, I'm sure that anxiety has to build when they, when they realize you know, enough time has passed now that anybody could find a phone charger, get to a, a phone, get to help, and so they start to lose that hope and it dwindles. But after so much time, how do people just even go on with their daily lives? I wanted to read this story. This popped up on um, Reddit, and uh, this is from... 1964. This is from the website The Crime Wire. Reed Taylor Jepson was born May 28, 1949 to his parents, Dr. Edward Jepson and his wife Elizabeth. Reed came from a large Mormon family in Salt Lake City, Utah. He was one of 11 children. He was an Eagle Scout and a good student. He was well liked by his peers and had a part-time job as a paper boy. Reed also had two German short-haired pointers, a, a full-grown dog, and a puppy, both of whom he enjoyed training to hunt birds. Additionally, he played for his high school's football team and had recently scored his first touchdown. At the time that he went missing, Reed was 15 years old, and a sophomore at East High School in Salt Lake City. On the morning of October 11, 1964, the Jepson family attended church. When they returned home early that afternoon, Reed opened a can of dog food and told his sister, Suzanne, that he was heading out to feed his dogs. She told him to hurry back because they would be having dinner in 30 minutes to which he replied, I'll be right back. With that, Reed left the home and walked 200 yards to where his family kept the dogs in a kennel. The Jepsons would never see or hear from him again. One of Reed's friends reportedly spotted him walking the dogs along the College of St. Mary of Wastash around 1 p.m. that day. After that, his movements are a mystery. When Reed had been gone for 12 hours, his family filed a missing person report with the Salt Lake City Police Department. The search for Reed Jepson had begun. An intense search was conducted in and around Salt Lake City, including the foothills, by law enforcement and the family. But neither Reed nor his dogs, or any clue as to what had happened to them, were ever discovered. Sources disagree as to whether Reed had been carrying any money with him that day. But according to the new, according to the Deseret News on October the 16th, he had $60 money which he had saved from his job as a paperboy. It's unclear 
what would have compelled him to carry this money with him on a Sunday when he only had intentions to go walk his dogs. There was a large number there were a number of unconfirmed sightings of the dogs in the days following their disappearance, but law enforcement believed these accounts were inaccurate and they seen different dogs. There were witnesses who claimed to see Reed as well, but the details of these sightings do not survive and are also unconfirmed. Although it may not be relevant to the case, one of the dogs reportedly had gone missing at an earlier date and returned two weeks later. The authorities in three states were notified of Reed Jepson's disappearance. In particular, law enforcement believe that Reed may have been heading to Missouri. He has supposedly met a girl from Missouri while he was working on a ranch in Wyoming, and they wondered if he might have secretly made the trip to see her. However, this lead went nowhere. According to John Jepson, Reed's older brother, a detective arrived at the home one day and requested to speak with the 16-year-old. John complied, and the two went for a drive. This is part of the conversation, according to John. Detective, okay, where is he? John, I don't know. Detective, you do know, and you have caused incredible heartache to your parents. You're hiding him. You're doing something in connection with his disappearance. Now it's time to stop playing games and tell us where he is. Apparently, one of Reed's friends who lived in the neighborhood had implicated John in Reed's disappearance. Unfortunately, the reasons for this are unknown. For his part, John maintained that he had no idea where his brother was, and that he had no knowledge of what had happened to him. It would appear that the detective was satisfied with John's answers during this interrogation because he was never questioned again. Reed Taylor Jepson was born May 28, 1949. He was 5 foot 6 and 145 pounds. He had blonde hair and blue eyes. He was last seen wearing blue jeans, a white shirt with a reversible parka that was blue on one side and black on the other. And he was wearing tennis shoes. Um... The Jepson family strongly believed that Reed had been abducted and felt certain that he would never have chosen to leave on his own. But to this day, no evidence of foul play has been found. There was allegedly a known pedophile living in the area at the time. However, he was questioned and, clearly, and cleared of any suspicion. The behavior of the man, his name has never been released to the public, was strange but the police could find no link to him and the disappeared boy. Here is part of the interview with the man. I'll tell you one thing. I would appreciate your finding out who killed him. Officer, how do you know that he was killed instead of running away? Most of the gossip said Reed was a runaway. Ma'am, well, I know that this length of time you're never going to find out. That does sound a little bit suspicious that he would assume that the guy was dead and maybe he just said that because he was hoping the police would find out something that would clear his name. But in the police report, it was noted that the man laughed when he said that. It was also theorized that Reed and his dogs may have had an accident while they were out walking or perhaps had been attacked by wild animals. It does not explain why there was never any evidence found. Reed's case was closed in 1966. The Jepsons were said to be a tight-knit family and were deeply affected by Reed's disappearance. Sadly, tragedy struck the family once again when Edward Jepson, Reed's father, committed suicide on December the 18th, 1965, just a little over a year after his son vanished. Reed's mother, as well as several of his siblings, have since passed away as well, tragically never having the closure or answers that they needed. Reed's case was reopened in 2010. 
Acting on a tip in 2012, the police searched a gully in Salt Lake City with shovels and a backhoe, looking for Reed's remains, but nothing was found. Officer Josh Ashdown has said this about the tip. Because of the nature of the case, I can't really get into specifics, but enough of a tip that it was worth searching out and we did take in some cadaver dogs and do some digging. Reed Jepson's unexplained disappearance is the oldest unsolved missing persons case on file at the Salt Lake City Police Department. Reed's sister Suzanne describes the effect the loss had on their family. When you have someone missing, the victim, the person isn't the only victim. The whole family begins to suffer. First you worry and then you turn into frustration and after years, despair sets in. Some of the comments that I've read on a couple of different websites, um, I thought I would try and look at some of the other leads and tips in the case that have received little attention compared to others. Although law enforcement did follow up at the time, the, the leads didn't go anywhere, but I wonder if it can shed new light on them now. It's always bothered me that the sighting at St. Mary of Wasash School was given so much credibility, but other information was sort of just brushed aside, especially considering the school sighting seems to not tie in with John Jefferson's John Jepson's memories of events at all. Um, so this person on Web Sleuths has done a little bit of their own digging and reports that motorists believe they saw the dogs were checked out. It seems that law, and, law enforcement received reports from several people that they had seen uh, the dogs. After looking into it, law enforcement didn't find anything. Hardly surprising as dogs were probably long gone. Now apparently this is several reports, not just one report, which adds credibility to the reports. That there were more than one set of the same breed of dogs. An older dog and a pup potentially wandering around in the same area. What this person is saying is that it seems unlikely that there was another set of dogs that looked identical to this man's missing dogs. And so why were these dogs, why were these leads about the dogs not really followed up on more? Unfortunately, there is no mention of what road the motorist saw the dogs on. It seems to me like that this man was picked up by somebody and his dogs were probably picked up as well. The fact that he told his sister he was going straight outside to feed the dogs and to take them for a walk and that he would be back within the 30 minute time frame before dinner sounds really strange that he just up and took off. But the, the story about him having met a girl and, and left to go be with this girl, I don't know that he would have taken his dogs, and if he did, um, why wouldn't he have um, just told his family, I'm leaving, I'm going to be with this woman, you know, I don't know. It seems possible that Reed may have been kidnapped, and the kidnapper ju just, didn't like, just didn't take the dogs. Afterwards, the dogs may have wandered off and had been picked up by other people. But I think once, if I picked up a dog and I'm out driving and I see a dog and, I mean, these were pointer dogs, but they were known to be hunting dogs. And I picked them up and took them home with me and then a few days go by and I see reports that there's a, a boy missing with these dogs. I'm going to come forward. Some people might not have, but, you know. Um... Kansas City, Missouri police were notified with information that he may be traveling to their city. This one has always stood out to me. Law enforcement received a tip that he may have gone to Kansas City. People don't just leave credible tips unless they have some information. Salt Lake City Police Department went to the trouble to notify Missouri law enforcement about the tip. 
Um, the only events that I can find that were happening close to the time Reed disappeared was a Beatles concert that took place October the 17th and a Kansas City Chiefs versus Denver Broncos football game that took place on the 18th. So I'm I'm assuming that they're saying that there would have been quite a few people in the town at that time. Both of these were a week after he went missing, so I'm not convinced that he went there for those reasons. We know he was a football fan, but would he have gone to that much trouble to go to see a game? But as of today, all these many years later, he is still a missing person. His case was reopened in 2010. I don't know if some leads had come in or if a cold case detective had just decided to reopen it. I'm sure that by now some of his siblings and family members have offered up DNA in case some remains are found. Uh, let me do one more quick search on the Doe Network. Not really a whole lot else. He was last seen while. There have been some questions on, in the comments on some of these websites, there have been some questions as to his father's suicide a year later. Some people speculate that the father did something to him. Maybe they got into an argument in a fit of anger. His father may have hurt him and, and caused his death in some way unintentionally or intentionally and just couldn't live with the guilt and shame of that. But why would he have not, at the very least, confessed before taking his life? It could also just be that he became so depressed and, and upset over the loss of his son or maybe someone came and confessed something to the father, maybe someone in the community, and he couldn't live with that either. So the only thing I can do to conclude this video is to just say, if you have any information about this, you may contact the Salt Lake City Police Department at 1-801-799-3000.